Before we jump into the message today, I want to make sure that you each have a piece of white paper and a pen. Does anyone need one? Raise your hand and Jean will bring you one. You're going to want this for the end of the message time. Anyone need one? Okay. I think we're in good shape. Will you join me, friends, in a word of prayer? Come, Holy Spirit, come and fill our hearts this day. You have a message for us in Scripture, and it's going to be different for each one of us. So please, Lord, think through us, love through us, and serve through us. We pray this in the name of the Christ. Amen. Love one another, love one another, love one another, Jesus said. Did anybody else learn that in church school? Children's choir, yep, a couple hands are going up. I'm not sure exactly where I learned it, but it's stuck in my brain forever. Love one another, love one another, love one another, Jesus said. Love one another, that phrase appears at least 15 times in the New Testament. Jesus talks about loving one another. The apostles talk about loving one another. Love one another, love one another, love one another, Jesus said. So why is it so easy to sing and sometimes so hard to do? Why are those three little words, love one another, such a challenge? I went back and I read Jesus' words to the disciples in the Gospel of John chapter 13 for a little explanation. Jesus had gathered them all together, knowing it was toward the end of his life, and he wanted to pass on to them some really important truths. So he said to the disciples, let me give you a new command. Love one another in the same way I loved you. Let me try that again. Let me give you a new command. Love one another in the same way I loved you. You love one another. And there it was. There was the reason that love one another is challenging. It's because it is a command. Did anybody else catch that word? Jesus doesn't say, I'd really like you to love one another. Jesus doesn't say, love one another as long as you really like the other person, or love one another just when you feel like it. Love one another only when the other person is kind to you. No, it's a command. Love one another. There are no opt-out clauses. There are no qualifiers, no trying to make it more palatable. Love one another. It is as simple as it is challenging. If you were to take the pulse of the heartbeat of America right now, it would not be beating out love, love, love. Tempers are short. Words are harsh. The political climate, the religious climate, they're all like really dry tinder that's ready to poof up and smoke at any moment, creating a huge inferno. I think that we live in a climate of lovelessness, and sometimes that has real consequences for innocent people. A week or so ago in Florida, a U.S. magistrate by the name of Judge Bruce Reinhardt was called upon to sign off on a search warrant for a certain property in Florida. Judge Reinhardt has received multiple death threats. His personal details have been published online. Judge Reinhardt is Jewish, and he sits on the board of Temple Beth David in Palm Gardens, Florida. His conservative Jewish congregation had to cancel their Shabbat services on the beach because of threats toward him, and members of the congregation. Here's the thing, the people threatening him, they did not even know him. They were total strangers. But did you know that Judge Reinhardt wasn't even supposed to be the judge to sign off on that particular search warrant? A different magistrate judge was supposed to be on duty, but that judge was unavailable, and so Judge Reinhardt was called upon to sign the warrant as is typical practice. Do you suppose that the judge who was supposed to sign off on the warrant is feeling relieved or maybe a little guilty, especially when they saw what strangers were doing to Judge Reinhardt? Author Brene Brown said this in an essay called Doubling Down on Love. Yes, the world is suffering from traumatic levels of lovelessness right now, but what really brought me to my knees these past few months was how susceptible 
I was to perpetuating lovelessness in my own response to our collective pain. As I started to untangle everything I was feeling, I realized that over the past few months, I had unknowingly turned away from love, the only fuel source that really works for me. Instead of being ruled by love, I unconsciously had turned to fear, contempt, self-righteousness, and maybe a touch of high-octane disdain to navigate hard news and hard people. Yowza. Have you, have I, turned away from love? It may be easy for us to look at poor Judge Reinhardt and the anger and vitriol that was being spit his way and say, those people are unloving. But the command of Jesus requires us to take out a mirror and look ourselves straight in the eye. Have we unconsciously turned to fear and contempt, self-righteousness, and high-octane disdain? Psychologist Eric Fromm said this, There is perhaps no phenomenon which contains so much destructive feeling as moral indignation which permits envy or hate to be acted out under the guise of virtue. Now, there are hundreds of different sermons that could have come out of today's scripture to love one another. We could have talked about loving yourself, loving your friends, loving your family. And to be honest, I was having a really hard time writing this sermon until I realized I needed to narrow the focus. So for today, I want to talk about the biblical command to love the stranger, since that is one that is rearing its head in a powerful and destructive way in our country. What does it mean to love the stranger? Loving the stranger is one of the earliest commands found in the Bible. In the Hebrew scriptures, in the book of Deuteronomy, we read, you shall also love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Love the stranger. So I have a puzzle for you. How many people do you suppose we will meet in a lifetime? By meeting, I mean a face-to-face -face encounter where you look someone in the eye or you wave your hand, you meet them in a place of business or in a casual conversation. How many of those do you think we'd have? Now compare that number to the number of people you count as close family and friends. One writer estimates that the total encounters was over 100,000 people in a person's lifetime. 100,000 encounters. That's 100,000 opportunities to practice love one another and love the stranger. Several years ago, I read this great book, A Same Kind of Different as Me, it's a story of Ron Hall, who was an international art dealer, and Denver Moore, who was a man experiencing homelessness. This deep friendship develops between these two men, these two unlikely people, and both of their lives are changed forever. The stereotypes of what it meant to be a rich person or what it meant to be a homeless person, they were destroyed. And what Ron and Denver discovered was how much they were alike. They learned that you are the same kind of different as me. And that title has stayed with me, same kind of different as me. Would we love the stranger more easily if we reminded ourselves that they are the same kind of different as me? Barbara Brown Taylor writes, at its most basic level, the everyday practice of being with other people it's the practice of loving the neighbor as the self. More intricately, it is the practice of coming face to face with another human being, preferably someone different enough to qualify as the capital O other, and at least entertaining the possibility that this is one of the faces of God. So which will it be for us? Seeing someone as capital O other or seeing them as same kind as different as me, or as one of the faces of a child of God. Think about those 100,000 encounters you might have in your lifetime. They are about as close to God as you and I are going to get here on this planet because every encounter we have is with someone Jesus loves unconditionally. 
This spiritual practice of loving one another or loving the stranger, it really doesn't require any special uh, setting. You don't need a personal trainer. You don't need any software. You don't need any equipment. It can be done anywhere, anytime, by anyone who resolves to do it. I like this story told by Dr. Kaplan James. She said, years ago when I was taking a graduate course in sociology, my professor had an odd course requirement. His requirement was that all of us, at least once a month, each student was to take what he called a cultural plunge. That is, we were to intentionally put ourselves in a place we would not normally go, among people we would not normally choose to be with. And in this strange environment, we were called to be participant observers. Here's what he meant by participant observers. We weren't there to only observe like you would if you went to a museum or to a zoo. We were to actively join them and participate in whatever they were doing. It was one of the most interesting assignments I ever had, she said. One month, she says, I went to the racetrack and joined the crowd that was feverishly betting on horses. I'd never done that. Another month, I went to the midnight showing of the cult classic Rocky Horror Picture Show. How many of you have done that one? You know this cultural experience. The audience often comes in costume, and they throw rice, and they throw toast, and they sing along with the movie. Other students in the class chose to go to a soup kitchen in a homeless shelter, a Star Trek convention, a meeting of the African Violet Society. My teacher's idea was this, she said. When you intentionally put yourself in an environment that is strange to you, again and again, your hostility towards strangers will gradually fall away. You start to realize that all people, even if they look and act different, they're people just like you. Same kind of different as me, isn't it? Barbara Brown Taylor concludes, Jesus himself did not have a home he could welcome people into. He could not cook anyone a meal nor offer anyone a bed. And so when others opened their homes to him, lending him a table to preside over for a night, he practiced his own philozenia, which means love of stranger. And it was much more likely to take place in a borrowed home, in a field, on a boat, on a road, on a mountain. Wherever people who felt like strangers happened to meet the person who made them feel like kin. It was a gift he had, this divine practice of encounter, so valuable to him that he did his best to teach his followers to do it too. Strangers meet the person who makes them feel like kin. Do you make others feel that way? I want you to do a little experiment with me, so I want to have you pull out your index card and your pen. Here's the hard part. With your non-dominant hand, I want you to write out on your card, I know how you feel. See if you can even do that. I know How you How are you doing? A lot of laughter. Here's mine. It's a uh, pretty terrible. I know how you feel. Hang on to this card for just a minute, please. Rob Bell tells a story about a time when he sprained his wrist. He is left-handed, so for a time he had to learn how to write with his non-dominant hand. He says, now normally when I see somebody with their arm in a sling or their wrist in a cast, it barely even registers. But the moment I had even the slightest trouble tying my shoes or typing or buttoning my shirt, I'm instantly reminded of all sorts of people I know who have physical limitations, limitations I don't even ordinarily notice. And a sprained wrist is nothing. It's a momentary inconvenience compared with what lots of people live with their entire lives. In those moments of trying to zip up my jacket, I felt a strong connection, a solidarity, empathy, just a taste of their everyday lives, and it connected me to them in a mysterious way. Same kind of different as me. 
All right, here's the experiment, and it's going to require a little bit of movement on your part. Take your card. Please stand if you have been affected by cancer. If you have had cancer, someone you love has had cancer, would you please stand? Okay, take your card and trade it with somebody around you who's also standing. Trade your card with somebody who's near to you. Stay standing. All of you who are standing as you look at the other people, what do you feel? Probably compassion, solidarity, connection, empathy for these other people. It's a very different bond than saying, you know, please stand if you've ever been to Hawaii. <laughs> this is something deep. It's a setting of strangers, and yet you mention cancer and there's instantly a bond, and you see that you are the same kind of different as me. Please remain standing. Please stand now holding your card. If you have ever experienced prejudice because of the color of your skin or because you had a disability, stand if you have experienced prejudice because of your gender or your gender identity or your sexual orientation, your age, your country of origin, please stand and join the people who are already standing. Okay, now trade your cards again with somebody else. Go ahead, move around. Feel free to cross the aisle. And stay standing. If you have ever experienced the death of a parent or a spouse or a child, would you please stand? Trade your card with someone who's standing near to you. All right, stay standing, all of you who are already standing. Please stand if you are a parent who has ever struggled in your parenting. <laughs> Please stand if you were ever a challenging child yourself. If you are a teen and your parents ever get on your nerves, go ahead and stand. If you're a child and your parents ever bug you, stand up. Go ahead and trade your cards. Last one, if you stand, remain standing or stand if you're in one of these categories. If you have ever moved to a new town, started a new job, gotten divorced and started a new life, moved to a new school, please stand. I think everyone's standing. All right, trade your cards one more time. Oh, how I wish you could see your faces the way I do. In this moment, we have all realized that you are the same kind of different as me. So how do you feel about the people in this room now? People you may not have met before this morning, do you have a connection with them? Please take a seat. Whosever card that you wound up with, you may not even know because they've been passed so many times. Will you take it home with you and will you pray for that person this week? Friends, how would the world be different if instead of seeing strangers or strangers as groups of people, we saw them as individuals the way that Jesus did? What does Christ's command to love the stranger mean to you now? May you and I learn to not only love those we are close to, may we also learn to love and welcome the stranger. May we make space in our lives. May we make it a priority in this faith community to truly welcome the stranger and to love one another. May it be so. Amen.
Whenever I get gloomy with the state of the world, I think about the arrivals gate at Heathrow Airport. General opinion is starting to make out that we live in a world of hatred and greed. But I don't see that. Seems to me that love is everywhere. Often it's not particularly dignified or newsworthy, but it's always there. Fathers and sons, mothers and daughters, husbands and wives, boyfriends, girlfriends, old friends. When the planes hit the Twin Towers, as far as I know, none of the phone calls from the people on board were messages of hate or revenge. They were all messages of love. If you look for it, I've got a sneaky feeling you'll find that love actually is all around. Love actually is all around. Please join me in a moment of prayer. Almighty and merciful God, you have given us a new commandment to love one another. Help us to follow in the words and ways of Jesus, who loved those who loved him back and those who sought to do him harm. He loved with compassion those who were outcast. He loved with healing power those who were ill. Christ loved with correction those who sought to put themselves above the law. Jesus loved without borders, caring not one iota for one's country or one's status. Christ loved with justice, always seeking God's ways in the world and not our world's ways. Jesus loved with shalom, praying that the world would know the fullness of peace. Christ loved with grace and mercy, forgiving where we could not. Jesus loved young and old, stranger and friend, sinner and saint, and calls us to love just as he loved us. That is our challenge. It is easy and oh so hard. So help us to be more loving, Lord, as we walk together in the words and ways of Jesus.